will give you some insight from the Clinton behind how an organization is constructed. I also want to point out that um, I uh, bring with me a wealth of managerial knowledge from, from my, my work, my, my business. Um, however, there are differences between uh, volunteer-based organizations and uh, business organizations, and I've learned a lot from uh, being uh, at the helm of a special organization or a third organization. Um, of course, that will be the presentation today. So, for some reason, the first, the first line takes time. Uh, so, why is this story? Why are we talking about this? Organizations very often fail. Uh, it's true. Volunteer organizations is true. Commercial organizations are true. Most organizations, in fact, fail. This book is true. Failure is, can manifest itself in various ways. One of the ways to do it and to fail is to exist. That's the most common way. They can also fail to achieve their objectives or uh, in some way fail to meet the expectations of the founders. So organizations are established for a reason. And if the founders or the people with the active within the organization do not achieve their goals, then of course that, that can be considered a failure. And, um, and volunteer-based organizations are in, a, in more of a bind than other types of organizations because with commercial organizations there's always money. And money it doesn't mean that there's money in the sense that you know, organization is something that can be running a loss, but there's money as an objective, there's money as a way to motivate people, there's money as a way to force people to do things. So it's easy. With, with volunteer based organizations, there's a lot more thought needs to be put into how the organization operates in order to ensure, ensure that it uh, continues to operate as it, um, uh, as it does. And the, plan, the, the, the solution to that is the plan. Plan ahead, be aware of where the weaknesses are, be aware of what you're trying to achieve, and make sure that you follow the plan. Um, so what I'll be doing to do today is give you a bit of an insight of now. In some sense, um, this is a talk for organizers. However, I think it will benefit all of you in terms of understanding a little bit of the constraints on sector organizations and, and the the benefits that sceptical organizations can bring to the sceptical community, and maybe it will drive some of you to become sceptical organizers, and that's also very important because there's never enough sceptical organizers. So, first thing, Susan promised me to, to dance with some of my slides, if you don't know so. The first thing with an organization, any organization, you need to know what you're there for. You don't establish an organization simply for a different name. You want the organization to present something, to do something, and it might sound like it's quite <coughs> obvious that they will establish a skeptical organization. What do we want to do? We want to be skeptical. Well, you can do that without an organization. So you need to know what the organization is there for. You need to know what the reason is. If you're putting in the time, the effort, it's very often the money as well. And the easiest way to answer that question is of what, what are we here for? is by breaking up into a vision, mission, and aims. Vision is the end result. It may never be achieved. It may not even be completely achievable. It's an aspiration. It's where you want to see society, the organization, the community, whatever it is that you want to do in the future. Mission is the focus areas on the way to that vision. And aims are the activities that you will form on the way to while while acting out the uh, acting on the on the mission and on the way to the vision. We adopted on the stress in the stress we adopted our actually so um, we um, we adopted uh, new vision, mission and aims just very recently. It took us a long time to find you our statement. I would say probably about six months. Uh, we started with a weekend where we spent time um, uh, just debating it for, for a whole weekend, two, two, two days. Then it took many months of actually thinking about the working out. The wording that appears society that makes decisions based on evidence, reason, and critical thinking, 
that actually, I think, is clear to all of you that this may never be achieved. Uh, or at least not completely achieved. However, working towards this goal is, is important. Uh, the car is aimed to a lot more internal looking and a lot more focused on the paranormal. Um, you can see all of those on our website, by the way, and I will point to that afterwards because I don't want you to go looking at that. Um, so that's, that's our vision. This is our mission. Um, really quickly, it's a trade safety scheme will advocate uh, critical thinking and scientific reasoning. Actually, I'm going to do that. The, the thing is that you will see that it actually breaks up our role in society and in the state of the movement into smaller uh, areas into more specific things that we actually need to activate in more, more specific areas that we need to activate in order to achieve our vision. Our vision. And finally, our aims. Um, I want to point out that our present is essentially a new one from the, from the new, uh, new uh, aims. And that is the public advocate for evidence based and rational decision making and policy development by individuals as well as government, such as our bodies and other organizations. It's very well, I think previous speaker, uh, and I think pretty much fits very well with the way the skeptical movement is heading today. The, uh, we spent probably about three of the six months we debated our divisions on, on, on the aims and making sure that you know, it was eight at some point and it was four and we uh, separated things and thought about the wording of each one. Even the order was prepared. Mm -hmm. Maybe it took us a little bit longer than it should. But I think it's better to get it right because you really should be bound by these other things that will say this is what we're here for. This is when you when you do something in your regulation, there's a debate whether should we be doing this, should we not be doing this, should we spend time and effort and money on this? The, this would be your guide, so it's very important. I don't think having goals is optional. Breaking it up into vision and names, eh, optional but advisable. All the rest is really from the experience of Australian skeptics, and um, some of it is my opinion, um, and uh, take, take out the people who work. So, I'll tell you a little bit about the specifics of how we put it all together. And by the way, I forgot to use a couple of times, so you will need to do when I'm out of time. Um, so, first of all, leadership. Um, every organization needs leadership. Mm -hmm. I will not say a leader because sometimes two people can go lead. Mm -hmm. I don't believe like from my experience hmm? that like more than two people can lead effectively. Um, hmm. Leadership by committee is not really leadership. It needs somebody who will actually help run the organization, set the direction, and make sure the direction for the uh, organization performs as it should. Now I want to make it quite clear that the leader, especially when it comes to your organization, but in general, is not there to tell people what to do. The role of the leader, and that's why I'm not saying the manager, I'm saying the leader, the role of the leader is to make sure that the organization moves forward, and it moves forward towards its goals. A good leader, especially in a skeptical organization, will be somebody who's very collaborative, who's willing to listen to others, who is good at motivating people and um, is not is not particularly interested in, in, their <coughs> own, um, in their own position and, uh, um, and their, their own name. Somebody who's interested in, in promotion and in being out there, it can be a valued member, a valued member of an, of an organization, but not, uh, probably not the leader because the leader needs to focus on the organization. The next thing is the board or executive. Uh, committee, I will call it interchangeably board and committee. You need to, there's a lot of things about, about a board. So, uh, first of all, a board is no social club. Okay? People who want to be on the board, because that's what we do on the second Tuesday of the month at 6 p.m., should be there. So, you need to think about that in the construction of the board. The, you need to be able to, you need to be, first of all, demand of people that they be active. If you want to be on, the, on board, you need to be active. But you also need to ensure that people have a way out. So, for example, in the Australian Skeptics, what we did was, this is, this is fairly new. One of the reasons I became 
president was because I realized that I needed to be that in order to accept changes. One of the major changes was to uh, start with the three year tenure on the committee. Now, it's not like after three years you have to leave, but after three years you have to think. You have to say, do I still want to be here? Or is it a habit? You have to justify to yourself and to the committee why you're still there. You have to apply for re for re-election to the committee. And surprisingly, within three years, we were left with no nappy numbers. Because they had to think about it. They didn't, we didn't have to throw anybody out. People really didn't want to be active just now. Um, how the members of the board are chosen is obviously a very important aspect of, of uh, the committee, whether they're elected by the membership or by invitation. It's, it, there's problems to both. Uh, with Australia Skeptics, who chose to be a, an invitation only committee, it has its challenges. It also has some really good things about it. For example, we can choose really good and effective meeting members, and we are not prone to a hostile takeover, which is something that has happened to, for example, the New South Wales humans who are taking over and not no, I won't have it. And by the Nazis. Uh, who were not after the humanists, they were after the humanists' um, uh, property. The humanists had a house. And they just wanted to take over the property. Uh, they managed to eventually, through legal means, push them out. But by the invitation, that would not happen. We still protect our money. Uh, I know another thing is, is, you want to have a committee that is essentially not of your current audience, but of your entire audience. That is really important. If you're going to have a committee of uh, very well qualified, very smart, 50 year old men, I, I have nothing against 50 year old men, I'm 53, so. Um, but if you're going to have that, you're not going to, have, you're not going to be attracting young women, for example. You're not going to be attracting anybody. It doesn't mean that you won't have anybody um, who's young or any women, but. I'm saying that but, you know, most of the organizations are majority men, majority white men, majority white men in their fifties. So, um, so it's something that the way against it is to, to make sure that you include in your committee, in your board, young people, women. We have now, actually, in, in August, we have finally reached the goal I've been working on for years, which is more than half of our committee is women. So, um, the reasons, by the way, not because um, uh, there's something unappealing per se about a committee of men. The reality is that I don't know what's appealing to a 25 year old woman, not intuitively anyway, not without asking. Having a 25 year old woman on the committee allows me to have that perspective. It allows the committee to actually work towards having more 25 year old women um, in, the, in our uh, active member group. The duties of volunteers, it's a touchy point because volunteers don't get paid. Um, but that's exactly what being a volunteer means. It means you don't get paid. It does not mean that you do not have agreements. And that is something that anybody who ever volunteers for anything, that's obviously specific to, to the committee members, but it's also true that's of the community at large when they volunteer for any or any, anything that they do. What? They need to remember that if they say they will do something, that is a commitment. It is not it is voluntary in the sense of they, they volunteer to commit. They don't volunteer to, once they commit to, it's not voluntary to do what they committed to do. And they need to be reminded of that, they need to be fact. And it's absolutely okay for anybody, even if they're paid, to sometimes say, look, life got in the way, I, I'm unable to do what I committed to do. It happens. However, first of all, it can't happen on a regular basis. And secondly, it needs to happen in a responsible way, early enough in advance so that the organization can recover from the situation and find a solution. One of the ways to motivate an organization, and again, this is something that reflects both internally on the committee and externally, is to have constant targets, things to work on. Targets could be projects of various kinds. They could be events, or they could be like, big projects such as, uh, you know, uh, uh, a few years ago, we had a Dr. Ken Harvey, a skeptical activist, sued for libel. And uh, we organized a big campaign to make sure that the uh, community sponsored, uh, supported Ken, and he ended up not paying a cent uh, out of pocket for the legal, for the legal challenge. But uh, uh, again, that was a big, a big move. It uh, created a lot of, uh, uh, lot of noise within, within, within the community and within the community at large, and that was a great target. However, we also need 
targets on an ongoing basis. So the really one of the things we've done was we started thinking about what are the main things that the community does. On a regular basis, so we have magazine and public relations, we have uh, finance to manage, we have um, grants, we, we, we are an organization with money, I'll talk about that shortly. We give grants, somebody needs to assess those grants. We have events, we have, okay, you know, every few years we organize a convention. There's all kinds of things that we do on a regular basis, or we have an investigation so so all of these all of these areas of focus, we established a subcommittee within our bigger committee to be focused on. And these are people who are dedicated to these areas. So they, they constantly have targets around these uh, focus areas, narrow focus areas, and there's something for them to do, something for them to look at. It's very important to have that, it's very important to have that for the wider community as well. One of the main roles, in my opinion, of a skeptical organization is to be a hub for media. And there's, there's a few things about being a hub for media. So you need to be known to the public. Um, and being a hub for media is part of being known to the public, but you also need to be known to journalists. So there's no easy way around that. But the, the, the easiest way of being known to journalists is to be there for them. Journalists nowadays are underpaid and, or, and way too busy. Their, their deadlines are impossible. Um, there's no time for proper investigative journalists. Help them by doing some of the work for them, you'll, you'll be doing very well. So, some of the things that you need to focus on is that there needs to be there so, somebody there to answer the phone. There needs to be somebody there to answer the phone. It doesn't actually mean necessarily to answer. First of all, there needs to be a phone number, but if you don't answer the phone straight away, that's fine. But call back within an hour because the journalist in an hour has something else to do. So, you have to get back to them. If they send an email, you have to get back to them straight away. When you get back to them within an hour, you have to have something to say to them. So one of the best ways for journalists nowadays is to have lists of experts at your disposal. People who are, first of all, quotable, that's, that's the most basic thing, but if there are people who can actually be interviewed, people who are good in front of the camera or behind the mic, and can a short notice be available, preferably obviously more than one person in the area of the focus of your organization, that is absolutely fantastic. Um, because journalists who get that kind of help from you will appreciate it and will come back for more. You'll be able to send a message, so, so that is obviously um, very important um, to do. You need to also have online presence. Without online presence, you simply do not exist. If you do not have a website, um, uh, Facebook, page and um, Twitter feed, you, you, you will not be noticed. And they need to be active. Your website needs to be updated on a regular basis. Your Facebook uh, feed needs to constantly be moving. Twitter, all the, you know, all the time. It doesn't even need to be things about your organization. Just link to something. But be, make sure people follow you all the time, otherwise you're not visible. Awards are another way of attracting attention. We give awards annually. There's positive awards, which attracts a modicum of attention. Unfortunately, look, we'll continue to give the, the positive awards. We have a step of the year. We have uh, uh, an award, award called the Fomet Award for the Promotion of Reason, which, we, which comes with a check, and it's given to a member of the public. Who doesn't, so not a member of the state community does something to promote skepticism. Uh, but we also have a negative award, which unfortunately attracts more attention. It's called the Benz Good Award after Rory Geller and his son. For anyone said about Rory Geller that he did Benz Spoons with a bar of mind, he's looking at the hard way. Um, <laughs> so, um, so we bet one with our hands and put it on a and uh, we get that once a year. Nobody's ever claimed it, by the way. Uh, the, the, thing about, the, the thing about those negative awards is that they're, they're very funny. They're definitely funny for us in Germany, but it's very easy for them to become mean in the eyes of the public. So you need to be very careful not to be mean. <coughs> uh, if somebody needs to be attacked, like Andy Baxter's, you don't want to go soft on them, but make sure that it's not personally mean. Attack their message, not them individually, and also try to punch, punch up, not down. Punch down, you're almost always being perceived as mean. So, 
you know, about a couple of years ago, we gave the award to a famous chef in Australia. He's on um, one of the food shows, which I try to ignore. Um, his name's Pete Evans, and he promotes all kinds of food from the paleo diet to the business of using uh, uh, sunscreen in the country with the highest uh, uh, rates of skin cancer in the world. So, we gave it to him. He's already controversial, he's already in the public eye. We would definitely not see him as being uh, controversial or punching down or being mean by attacking him for what he was doing. But just be careful with the awards. Uh, members, we want to grow forward, obviously. Uh, we discussed already about how the structure of the board with, uh, is uh, important for your membership. Again, the role and the, how members are included, how they feel the government's organization is something that I'm not going to give you answers for, but it's something that you need to consider. For example, with Australian skeptics, for a very long time, members were simply people who were subscribers of our magazine. Uh, they were not able to vote for the committee. I already mentioned that our committee is by invitation only. Uh, but obviously, we constantly come within our member board and invited people. The, um, what's happened over the years is that we found that as uh, magazine subscriptions fall, uh, the active activity in our events, for example, uh, rises. So that told us that something wrong with that. So we're now working on a slightly different model. We found we, we discussed with our membership, and basically there were a lot of mostly younger people who said, we don't want the magazine. So we said, okay, so just subscribe and you'll get the magazine and don't read it. No, no, I don't want the magazine. So we just don't read magazines. To them, the fact that it's a subscription is a negative. So they are going to have to spend the same amount of money on city supporting the organization. So we're working on a support model at the moment, which will come out soon. Again, I, I don't have answers to these questions, but we definitely want to think about how you make people included, how you make them feel like they're part of the organization. The organization needs to be uh, protected, in particular, the members of the organization need to be protected. You're, you're skeptics, you're going to say controversial things, you're going to say things that upset uh, people, and there's a chance that you'll get sued. In Australia, there's a way to protect yourself by becoming an incorporated association, you protect the members of the organization, the organization can still get sued. However, the individuals within the organization, if I say something as president of Australian skeptics that upset someone, then you know they can sue the organization, they can't sue me personally. Okay, or a yellow. Yeah. Um, so, the, in all countries there will be something, in the European Union, definitely there will be some structures that allow you to protect the members of the organization, it's very important. Still, at the same time, you know, members, if you are, you can be sued personally for something that you say, you know, make sure that you're responsible for what you Funding is obviously very important. You want to have, uh, you want to have funding because without funding it's very difficult to be effective. You can't have a website without funding. There's only so much money that the engineers will be willing to spend on travel and printing and websites and all kinds of things like that. The best way um, <coughs> to raise funds is through donations, especially in the early days. Uh, we have been very fortunate uh, with requests. Requests, sorry, uh, to those of you who are familiar with the first language, is basically money that people live in their will. Um, people live a lot. Uh, people leave a lot more money in their will than they give in donations because they don't need that money anymore. <laughs> so, um, if, if we, we have been uh, very fortunate. There, there's a cultural element so to how you do it. You need to be sensitive about it. Okay? Yeah. Otherwise, it's very easy to be creepy. But, but there are, you know, just think about how within your own organization, within your own culture, you can come up with a uh, way to encourage people. To, uh, to give you the organization specific requests. I'll see the events because um, I, I need uh, a bit more time to speak about two minutes and I want to speak about collaboration. Which, okay, so collaboration. That's probably a good note to end on, and it's been mentioned um, um, by Sophie, it's been mentioned by Andres. Um, that we have the strength of a common language within Australia that allows us to have all these organizations collaborate towards the common goal quite easily. However, I think it's very important within Europe to not be, not be discouraged by, by the cultural and language barriers. Don't let them stand in your way. First of all, my impression, and I 
could be wrong, but my impression is that definitely the younger uh, members of society generally speak English. So, come with that, to some extent at least, use the material, use, use the common language in order to ensure that you're able to collaborate. It's really, the, the reason collaboration is so important is because it's just better use of resources. That's, that's the main thing. If you don't, if you don't collaborate, you're, you're repeating things, you're repeating mistakes, you're, you're repeating the actions that other organizations have already been through. And it's just unnecessary. I think um, um, the EXO is probably a, a good position to help in that. Uh, I think it's very important to communicate on a regular basis, make sure, I don't know, maybe something like a, a, a mailing list where the heads of the local organizations report once a month on what their activities are would be a good idea because that, that's the kind of thing where you just say, oh, I'm actually working on something similar to mine. Let's talk. You know, okay, so you can't actually collaborate on something specific because the because the focus areas may be local. However, techniques, um, um, resources, material, you know, if they're, uh, if they're translating into the languages, there's all kinds of things that you can do much better if you collaborate than you can do as individual organizations. And I, that, that's probably the strongest message that you can do. Collaborate between all the various European organizations. And um, if I haven't answered some of your questions about how organizations can be more effective, I'd be happy to answer more questions in the panel later because we run out of time. And you can also write to me. Um, my name is quite easy to remember if you remember my name, which is difficult to be somewhite. Write to me and I'll be happy to answer any.